Live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world. You are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Naham Klegman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 34 of the From Entrepreneur. And today I am super excited. I have an incredible guest. I'll tell you, his name is Ephraim Rosenberg. And why am I so excited? Because one of the questions I'm asked most is when you is how do I make extra income online? How do I start an online business? How do I start selling online and making money? Especially you have a lot of cool guys that are looking to spend just a few hours a day working sales. And we'll get into it if you could do it with just a few hours a day. But they're looking for a way to make income online. And one of the most popular ways to do this is Amazon, selling on Amazon. And I have with me today... Ephraim, who's not only an expert in selling on Amazon and, and has been selling on Amazon and has been selling online for more than 20 years, but he started a group of from Amazon sellers that are in the hundreds and together they support each other's efforts. So I'm very excited about this episode. I'm very excited to hear uh, Ephraim's story. So Ephraim, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Nachum, and thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. I, I'm looking at some of your other guests, and I'm a bit humbled that i um, included in your very important list of guests. So thank you for having me. And I, I love seeing on Skype on my caller ID, Beit Shemesh Israel. There's something special about that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, technology today. Okay, great. Um, yeah, like you said, basically, I've been selling online. I started off with eBay within a few months after eBay started. The concept of eBay was introduced. Now, it's very important for your, sell- for your listeners to know that selling on eBay and Amazon has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. And it's always changing, but it's changed in the past few years more than it's changed at any previous time. And I want to explain a little bit how it changed and how it affects everybody. When eBay started this concept of, of allowing anybody to sell online, the way it worked was that they were just a marketplace. Say, for example, you go to any mall in Israel and you go into a store and you have a, an issue with somebody, with a store owner that's, that sold you merchandise, you felt that he owes you money, he ripped you off. You can't go to the person who leased the mall the, who owns the lease, the, the person who owns the actual mall and, and the guy's paying rent to, you can't go to him and say that your, your tenant ripped me off. eBay, right. eBay used to be like that. So I would go into, so let's say you would buy something from me and then you would have a problem with me. So you would go complain to eBay and eBay would say, well, we're just a marketplace. We're just a person who's what, what, what's giving the lease to the, to the store owner and you got a deal. You got to take the person, you got to take me to court. Now, the system pleased itself, and it worked pretty well. It worked, I would say, 98% of the times. The way it worked was feedback. So if I wanted to buy something and I would look at a, pers- a seller's feedback, I would look at all, right. the, I would look at all his terms. Um, I would try to figure out um, you know, if he has a real business besides. You would get a feel from the listing of how... Uh, you know, how long he's been in business and you would get a feeling if, if it was sort of like an educated guess and it was up to you to decide if you want to buy the item or not, but you're really taking a risk. And the, re- the reason why it didn't work so 100% is because people would do different tricks. Like for example, somebody would sell a thousandth of an item, a $1 item. So of course, they'll get a thousand great feedbacks. Then all of a sudden, He'll put up um, 10 Rolex watches for $5,000. Now, you, uh, you're an innocent consumer. You see that this guy has a thousand great feedbacks. He's been in business the past few months. Nothing ever goes wrong, so why wouldn't you trust him? You don't know right. that this whole thing, the system was not sophisticated enough, and people were not sophisticated enough to realize that th- this is all a setup and a trap. And eBay's brand, I would say even today, is still not what Amazon's brand is. Because people just say, here, eBay, and they hear that it must be a bunch of junk, and, and even though it's completely untrue. Today, what happened was Amazon got involved, Amazon and eBay, eBay followed Amazon, they're involved in every part of the transaction. You're just fulfilling it. It's not even your customer. It's Amazon's customer. It's eBay's customer. You're just selling the item. They don't even want you to communicate with the customer. And they, and they please it so harshly and it, that, that today, like when I buy something and most of the people in the world, when they buy something, they don't even look who they're buying it from. They don't even look at the person's feedback because the system works so well. They know that anything goes wrong, Amazon is going to step in. And Amazon, they make sure, they squeeze the seller so hard that the seller is always going to make sure to do the right thing. The reason why we created a group is because it's gotten to a point that Amazon is so harshly policing it that it, that somebody could literally be in business 
for 10 years, 15 years and have 50 employees and, and do, I, I've had people who are doing $100 million a year and one day they would have one or two customers complain and because Amazon has this system that they're so protective of their image, of their brand, that they'll literally just kick you off and, be, and you'll be out of business. And Crazy, yeah, it, crazy. It's really, it really like the, the sellers today have such anxiety that the first thing, uh, I would say 90% of the, of the people who have asked, I asked, I asked most of the sellers in our group, What's the first thing you do, Mata Shabbos? And they all say they check if they're still in business. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, it's, I, I know when uh, I, I had an apparel company for a little while and, you know, we were trying to sell on Amazon and the process just to get accepted to Amazon took many, many weeks and back and forth. And it was just an insane process just to be able to sell properly through Amazon. Right. And they do that for the Amazon image, for the Amazon brand, the Amazon trust. And, and because they do all this, you know, with 100 percent certainty that when you click buy it now and you're going to get the item and they say you're going to get it and the system works but the issue which i'm addressing is this little bit of a dark side of amazon is the way they they squeeze the sellers and the anxiety and the fear in which the sellers which which in a way they appreciate it because if if other sellers wouldn't be doing the right thing then no one's going to buy from me so i understand the way amazon does it but there are still many situations in which sellers are either trying to do the right thing in which we help them making sure that they're doing the right thing. And there are other times where they are doing the right thing and just one, one buyer can just come and take advantage of the system because he wants free shipping on the return and he'll say that he got, he got a used item and the guy, you know, one or two of those complaints, he can literally be gone. Well, I want to delve into this uh, a little deeper uh, a little bit in a little bit later in the episode. But first, I want to do a little backtracking. I want to hear a little bit about Ephraim Rosenberg. Where where were you born? Where were you raised? What schools, yeshivas you went to? And then, like, how did you get involved in online selling? Okay, Ephraim Rosenberg was actually born in Borough Park. Um, I live now in Flatbush. I went to Tervedas most of my life. I learned in Eretz Yisrael for four years. I learned in the yeshiva Leva Vom. Which is now still, it, which Rav Chaskal Weinfeld is the Rosh Yeshiva, it's still around as a Kurlo. And then I went to the Mir, I learned by Valley Baruch Finkel. And I was there for four years. And when I came back from Yeshiva, I started college. I, I was really a computer programmer. And I did computer pro- Oh, wow. You spent four years in Eretz Yisrael, and then you went back and started college? I started college after, exactly. I didn't, I didn't do it. I was actually, actually, when I went back to, to America, most of my friends were already almost done. But I finished it right. pretty quickly. So at 21, I started, and then I got married in between. But six months after I got married, I already graduated with a programming degree from Turo. Wow. And those days, if you remember, it was like the end, the late 90s. Anyone that said the word computer was getting a great job. So right away, <laughs> yeah, everyone was, a, it was a dot-com boom. So right away, I got a fantastic you know, within a few months, I was already working for, I worked for Bell Atlantic, I worked for, for Cablevision, then I worked for two years for Morgan Stanley. And those days, like, as I was working, people were calling me, other consulting companies were calling me, trying to pull me away. Like, everyone was looking for computer programming. What happened was, actually, what, what changed everything, I, I worked in downtown booking for Morgan Stanley, and 9-11 happened. Mm. And I actually saw the entire buildings go down right in front of my eyes because I worked, if you're familiar with the city, downtown Brooklyn and downtown Manhattan are like a stone's throw away. So I was never in any kind of danger at all. But we literally saw everything happen right in front of our eyes. And wow. yeah, it was incredible. Really, really. Every, every, every year, 9-11, I, like, I feel like a Tim Kipper for me. I'm like shaking and nervous because I still didn't get over it. Sure. And what happened was that if you remember, the, the whole, obviously, you know, Merrill Lynch, Morgan, all the whole financial industry completely stopped. And all the big companies were not willing to hire because, were not willing to fire employees because it would have looked terrible that 9-11 happens and employees lose yeah, their fire. jobs. Exactly. Right. But, but I was a consultant. So a consultant is considered like by these big financial companies almost like just as, as an expense. Mm. So that's why, that's why a, lot of the, a lot of times like they can hire, they say they can hire headcount, but they can hire um, consultants. So just like they can buy computers, they can hire consultants. But you could be in, in a company like Morgan Stanley, you could be in a consultant for 20 years. Right. So I, I was there already for two years and I was already like part of the, co- you know, I felt like I was part of the company. But then after 9-11, so they just got rid of all the consultants because they had to, they had to have, they needed the space and they also needed to have, you know, they had to get rid of, they had, they had to save money and, and the most convenient way, which look, looked best for them is if they get rid of the consultants. So right after I lost that, it was almost impossible to find a job. 
So, wow. Yeah, so so I bounced around, and and even, and even the jobs. It was such a. I remember. I remember there were companies telling me, headhunters at the time. Companies were telling me that they have stacks of resumes of people who have ten years experience. Merrill Lynch, and at the time, I, I would be at my prime. I was like twenty. I don't know, twenty seven. You know, five years experience, financial, but. The, you know, even the companies that were hiring were paying pennies. So on the side, what I was doing, like I, like I mentioned before, I was, I was always selling on eBay and Amazon on the side. So I kept, just to keep busy, I kept doing more and more of that. And even though I had some other programming jobs over the years, I eventually just did eBay and Amazon. And from what I understand, the programming world is actually a little better now, but I'm completely happy that I left it because I think it's very hard for a firm person, you know, when you're getting salaries and you're, com- you're competing with India and the whole world, it, it's not so easy as a programmer to, to support a family, I feel. Interesting. So what were you selling back when you were first getting started? Okay, so when I, when I first started initially... When, when eBay started, there, there was a, it was very lopsided. There were a lot of buyers and very few sellers because in order to sell something on eBay those days, like it was actually a skill. Like people used to contact me and they say, oh, they have this item and you know, we'll split it 50-50 and they'll sell it up. Today, every kid is walking around with, a, with an eBay app and two clicks, that the item is up. So they don't need, the, the, the skill part is no longer necessary. Um, mm-hmm. Today, it's more like, like the business part, like getting an item cheap enough that you can make a profit or coming with some kind of a twist where, where people want it and, and you can sell it. But the actual technical part of selling is zero skills involved. And, mm-hmm. and what, what I was selling then was just random things, anything that I can get uh, my hand on. It's called today retail arbitrage. Then it was just called going to a store and reselling it. But retail arbitrage is, is a huge business today, which I actually do not do on Amazon sort of frowns upon. But retail arbitrage basically means that you go into Target and you go into any any store where they're having a major sale, and they're selling it cheap enough where you buy off, you know, a big quantity of it, and sometimes they give it to you even cheaper than what they're selling it for, and then mm-hmm. and then you go and you sell it on Amazon. And the reason why it's important for your listeners to know the reason why Amazon is against it, by the way, is because, like I said, Amazon wants everything perfect, and in their view. When you go into a store like Target and you buy some, you take something off the shelf just because you bought it as new doesn't mean that you can sell it as new because things have shelf life. People look at it and they open it and they and they um, they you know they, they play around with the item and the, the box sometimes gets damaged. If it's in a warehouse with a pallet and plastic around it, shrink wrap, that's considered new. They, Amazon today frowns. Yeah, Amazon frowns on that today. Mm-hmm. But that, I mean, arbitrage back then. So you weren't like buying, you weren't selling used things. You were going around, uh, even in the early days, you realized that, hey, I could buy something uh, for cheaper. And, and and I've heard stories like that. There are people that like, just because you get something on the East Coast, but there were things on the East Coast that you couldn't get in the West Coast. So you would buy a lot of the East Coast stuff and then sell it to people on the West Coast. Yeah, it was either that or a lot of times, you know, there, there were businesses like no, 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 no one was able to sell online. So like people, if people heard somebody that is able to do it, the whole concept was like new. So you had businesses that were around for many years and they had boxes and boxes of stuff and if I can and 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 if I was able to give them 50% of what I can get that was 50% more than they would get because they would just sit there for another 10 years ah so I, I would see. get you know whatever I can get I can get in the early days it was whatever I can get a hold of and I and and then I you know I I made some more contacts more contacts I was able to to buy deals as, you know as as you accumulate you know, I accumulated a couple of dollars. I was able to buy deals and, and you know, and double that and triple that. And, and I kept doing that. But it wasn't any like specific market which I was targeting. It was just basically whatever I can get my hands on. And then I was just reselling it. So when did you uh, switch over to Amazon? Okay, so Amazon, the first few years when eBay was humongous, like it was like Amazon is today. Just like today, people don't think Amazon will ever have competition. Right. eBay was like unstoppable. There was, sure, there was I no, remember. Yeah, there was nobody like eBay. And then Amazon, people kept telling me that, oh, you got to try Amazon, you got to try Amazon. So I, I got on Amazon and something like, like, like a few weeks after I got on, I, I already got kicked off. <laughs> and, and yeah, and, and, and what, what happened? Well, when was this? This, this must have been it, it, like 10, 12 years ago. Okay, wow. Yeah, so, and I didn't, at, at the time, I didn't care because what was Amazon? It was like being, get kick, it was being kicked, getting kicked off, let's say, of Jet.com today. Like, who cares? It was so small that I didn't even right. care. But then people kept telling me that you got to get on Amazon. I heard it was getting bigger and bigger. So every once in a while, I would like send an email, hey, you know, my name is Ephraim Rosenberg and I sell on eBay and I made a couple of mistakes when I listed the items. And I would ask them if I can get back on and I would get this automatic 
email, you know, sorry, Amazon's trust, and I can't get back on. Then one day I actually got an email from uh, email from Jeff Bezos. I got an email from Jeff Bezos. Obviously, are you serious? No, no, it wasn't an email from Jeff Bezos. It said Jeff Bezos. You know, like when. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm not. So when I saw, you know, obviously if you respond to that, he has a hundred people reading his emails. Right. So, so, so I figured, you know, let me give it a shot. And so I wrote my whole story and I said, you know, if I can have another chance and I, and, you know, I came, I said I made a mistake and if I can please get back on and lo and behold, I was able to get back on. Now today, wow. yeah, now today it's a known thing that when you're suspended and you've tried everything, you email Jeff Bezos and there are quite a lot of stories of people. That's like a lot, that's like a Hail Mary, you know, like, <laughs> just yeah, you should re- hoping that it gets yeah, to Jeff. Yeah, yeah, and he he has people. So so you know, like when, when all else fails, people actually email Jeff Bezos, and obviously he has you know there's, there's a lot of information online of of how that works. And yeah, what's his email? Jeff at Amazon dot com. There's like ten different emails. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he must have he must have like a hundred people reading it because it became a known thing that if you contact Jeff B, if you could somehow get his eye to look at the issue, the problem is solved. <laughs> wow! So <laughs> so so then that was just, today today is like a known thing. Like all the people who deal with Amazon suspensions, they know it's called a Jeff email. You know, they know as a last resort, you also, you also email Jeff. But then I just like sort of thing, and I gave it a shot, and I got on. So so that was around ten years ago. And that's when, you know, then already I knew I got to be more careful. And I was selling on Amazon, I would say, for ever since, you know, we, and I really never had an issue. Everything, everything was completely, uh, you know, I always made sure to do everything perfectly. And but like, you know, like, like I mentioned earlier, wanting to do the right thing for Amazon and eBay is not enough. They want you to do the right thing. You know, Mahsava Taiva Kamais is not going to help um, <laughs> when it comes to them. And so let me ask something. Yes. When you were saying you're selling on Amazon, I know that you could. There's two ways to sell on Amazon. One where Amazon handles everything. They you you ship your product to them. They have it in storage. They take care of everything. Or you could ship it yourself. So which do you do, and what's the main differences? Okay, that's a good question. Um, it's called FBA. FBA is fantastic. FBA means that you get your pallets. There's some people who even there are even. Um, time. There are even ways you can get. If you're importing from China, you can go from China directly to Amazon. But I, I myself have never done that because I always felt it was a little too risky. You know, if, if if you know if they messed up the color, I like first taking everything in and inspecting it. But I know that right. I know that there are people who do that. But FBA basically means that you get your pallets into your warehouse. They come to you, and then you send it to Amazon, and then you're basically finished with. The transaction. They find the customer. They deal with the customer service. They they basically take care of everything. Now, it's a, it, in a way, it's a lot safer selling that way because if let's say a customer complains that he didn't get the item, so so that's on Amazon. That has nothing to do with you. Right. Just to tell the listeners, FBA stands for fulfillment by Amazon. Right. Fulfillment by Amazon, meaning they fulfill it. And and you know, for some people, some people really love this business model because then they could they could just send it and. Like, like if you're shipping everything yourself, you know, and you're, let's say, doing 100 orders a day, and all of a sudden you get a great deal, and you're, and, and you're going to be shipping 2,000 orders a day, right, which happens. So if you're selling everything yourself, what are you going to do? You're going to start hiring 12 employees, you, you need a new warehouse, you're not set up for it. But FBA right. allows a person who has, you know, one or two or no employees, has to be employees, and you can grow to, to a humongous business because they're handling all the shipping. And I'll tell you something else. Even if you have a website or if you're selling on eBay, you're completely able to drop ship from Amazon's inventory and they, they, don't, they don't charge you a transaction fee. They only charge you like a shipping and handling fee, which is pretty reasonable. Oh, so, I mean, if you sell something, if you have stuff on Amazon, but you sell the same item through eBay... You could ship from Amazon directly to the winner? Yeah, you can go into – exactly. Yeah, it's not a winner. If the guy buys it or if it's on your website, you could oh, – Well, I guess I was thinking auctions. Yeah, right? yeah. E- eBay doesn't – eBay today auctions uh, is – you know, I, mean, I guess that's right, – It's like one third – one quarter of their business. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're trying to be like Amazon where you just buy everything. I myself, I don't know if I've ever bought in my life uh, an item by auction. I, you know, I, I, just, I, just, I just buy it and, and that's it. So, so if you sell something off your website or even on your phone – Amazon FBA is like a fulfillment center, so they'll deal with with shipping it. And even if it gets lost, they'll insure it for you. So you can literally run your entire business from Amazon. It's not 100% correct, you know, foolproof because, you know, for international shipping, it doesn't really work. And, you know, so if you don't have the merchandise and a guy orders something 
from to Croatia, if it's in your warehouse, you can ship it. If it's in Amazon, you can't really, you can only send it within the United States. And also a lot of times if a guy orders, if, if someone orders, let's say four different items and that's one of the items, if you don't have it. Yes. So, you know, you have to now ship them two different places. So it's not, it's not perfect, but you can run 80% of your business that way. And what? And but I, I assume Amazon would take more of a cut, or you, there's different rules. Yeah, they take that? they take all kinds of cuts. It, p- part of this issue of selling on Amazon and there is software which which deals with it is, is if you're w- working on tight margins and small percentages, they take so many cuts. They take a cut here, they take a cut there. And if it's FBA, since they're storing it for you, so if, and by the way, they're insuring it for you. So if there's a fire over there, you're, you're covered. Right. If if so so you, you know you have to weigh all those costs. Like if if you're going to store everything in your own warehouse, first of all, especially if you're in a in a place where you're paying a lot of rent, a big warehouse, you probably need another one or two employees. You definitely need high insurance if something happens. Sure. Um, there there's a lot of costs which 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 uh, which are gained by having Amazon. No, but you could still use like a, another uh, fulfillment center. It doesn't have to be Amazon, and you could probably still do better financially. Well, yeah, well, you could, you could, and I actually do. I actually have another fulfillment center which I do. And it doesn't have to be Amazon. That's correct. But Amazon, they 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 do the hardest part. They sell it to you. They find you the customer. So you're saying if you use FBA, there's there's more of a chance that your your listings will show up higher in search results. Yes, that's exactly correct. If if you're selling it, see, F, uh, Amazon has something which is called Amazon Prime. Amazon sure. Prime basically is that you pay a subscription fee, something like a hundred dollars a year. I think, it's, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's a great value. And then anything which they, which either Amazon has, which they sell themselves, or anything which they have possession of. So if I sell my merchandise to Amazon FBA, that becomes eligible for Amazon Prime. So now you have hundreds of millions of customers who like to buy Amazon Prime. The reason why they like to buy Amazon Prime is because they guarantee everything like in one or two days shipping. Mm. Plus, they do put it much higher in the search rankings. They have a much, much better chance, probably like a three times better chance of selling it if it's on FBA as opposed to selling it on Amazon and you shipping it yourself. So tell us a little bit about your products. What do, what do you sell and how long have you been selling it or do you switch products every couple of years or, and how do you get your products, et cetera? Okay, so there are two basic types of business models being sold in Amazon. There's one thing called branded items and there's something called private label. Branded items basically means that you go to, I don't know, Minolta, you go to a big company and you normally it's a, normally it's a, it's, a, it's some kind of closeout or if you're buying regular merchandise from these big companies these days, I would say it's close to impossible. Unless you're a humongous company, you're buying millions of dollars, I would say it's close to impossible to actually make a profit on it because every everyone is going to have a nephew an uncle who's going to be able to also buy it at that price. But what you do is you buy, you go to Sony and you buy, you know, if there's a closeout deal available and there are sometimes available, sometimes it's refurbished, but there are certain times deals available and, and if you buy a big deal, you could definitely sell it. But what you're doing is is you're selling a branded item. You find the listing on Amazon, then you just add your, it takes like a, a minute to sell it. You just add your listing to that description. And before you know it, people are going to start buying it from you. So that that's basically the branded item. That's probably the easiest way to get started. All you need is a couple. I said but you'll go to you'll go to like Canon whatever, you'll find a close out, you'll buy let's say a, a hundred cameras, but then you have to have then you buy this then you have those hundred cameras shipped to Amazon. Exactly. Correct? You have you have you have the, you have all those shipped to Amazon and then you just you pretty much just, you know, hope uh, people buy it. There's not much you could do. Once Amazon has it on a listing which is already created, you don't really have control over that listing because the original person who made the listing, you know, more times than not, it's probably Sony made it five years ago when the item came out. So the original seller or the original manufacturer that made that listing, they already optimized it. It's already ranked, which means it already has a ranking of, of which goes up and down in the search results. There's not much you can do. You can pretty much just buy it and all you can do is adjust the price. Okay. Now, now that that's one, but what's becoming more and more popular these days is something called private label. Private label is essentially what you become the Sony. In other words, let's say I go and I can produce a certain item. Let's say, um, I don't know, bow ties, correct? So I buy bow ties and I could do it a certain way. I could, I could design it with a certain color. I put my own brand on it. I manufacture it. I create the listing. Now what happens is if this listing catches fire, nobody else can sell it. 
So you're basically selling to, you're, you're open to selling it on Amazon. They have hundreds of millions of customers. And just like Sony is able to sell it, and when they have, when there are 30 sellers on a listing, Sony is ultimately making the most money. You become the right. Sony and you're the one which, which profits. And, and this is by far much more profitable and it's much more of a business because if you're buying branded items deals, or let's say you're in business 30 years, you're only making money. So it's, it's like having a good drink. You know, you're only making money on the, on the profit. But you're not really right. you're not really building a business. So the business is me. That let's say I know how to buy deals. But if you're able to brand an, an item, it doesn't you don't have to make it Sony. But if you're if you're able to create an actual brand which is popular on Amazon, then you can create social media presence. You can create a website. You can create an Instagram account. And now all of a sudden you become a brand name. In my opinion, and I think it's pretty obvious, you're actually creating a business which can eventually be sold. So I I have I actually sell motorcycle audio equipment, which is accessories which go on motorcycles and that's pretty much what i do i have my own brand and i you have your own brand I meaning you'll for example like a let's say what what type, what type of accessory for example like for example on, on motorcycles that let's say intercom headsets or cup holders or audio right. systems which go on motorcycles all right let's say take something simple cup holder right right for motorcycles so you'll go you'll go to china and Find a manufacturer of cup holders for motorcycles yeah. and then put your brand on it? Yeah, pretty much that's what it is. You, 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 you try to do something a little bit different because a lot of the molds which people, there are a lot of like public molds which anybody can can do. So if you're just putting like a, like a sticker and say, you know, Moishi's cup holder and, right. and you sell it on Amazon and say, hey, this is my own brand. So Amazon, is, and, then, and then all of a sudden I come and I start selling it too. Amazon is not going to protect you and Amazon is not going to say that, you know, it's Moishi's cup holder and you have to get off the listing. But if you create an actual brand, meaning you create a trademark, and when you create the cup holder, you do something maybe a little different, not, not always necessarily, but somewhat unnecessary, and you create not just a sticker, you create, um, it's actually inside the, you know, you create manuals which have the company and you have a website and a Facebook and a social presence, you trademark the name, you, you, you put in some effort in making the name real, and then someone else comes along and, you know, he goes to China, he finds the finds the person that makes the same cup holder, it'll be the same thing that let's say if I go to the factory that's producing Nike and I say, hey, right. it's the same exact thing. Can I put it up? So of course, I mean, I could probably get into legal trouble very quickly for doing that, even though it's actually the same thing because I don't have permission to do it. So that's the main business. It's called private label. And that's where I think the real money is today. And, and the reason why it's, it's real money is because there's no, there's no competition. It's just a lot harder to start off that way. Mm. But as you said, you know, first of all, I think and uh, people should realize this, that there's no easy way to make money. Like everything takes time, effort, work. You know, it's not like um, no, there's no... You, know, you just turn it on and find something on Alibaba and then sell it and boom, you're making a ton of money. No, no, right? no. It's, it's, it's real work. Yeah, it, it, see, even even like like I have like relatives that are like that for 40 years they were importing China. See, 40 years ago, there was some kind of skill involved in, in you know, even if it was MP3 players, that if you were selling MP3 players and you were able to get it from China, so there was real, you know, if you had a connection and they trusted you and you had terms, so you bought something to, to, to the table. 20 years ago, it was still, it wasn't a, a complete joke and there was still a little bit that if you were able to do it, there was some skill involved in actually importing. Today, anybody can go on Alibaba. So, it, so, so to actually just go and find MP3 plays and buy 10 MP3 plays, I don't see how that's a strategy that's going to make you money. However, if you can come up with some kind of twist, like I, I, I was reading an article about this company and I thought it was a genius idea. What, what they do is they, they have people that read, they go through all the Amazon reviews, all, you know, they go through Amazon reviews and they try to find a pattern of an item which is missing something. In other words, let's say they see an item which has 6,000 reviews and it says, right. great item, I just wish the batteries would be rechargeable. So he, mm. so he would go and he would actually produce it. That's that's uh, very smart. That, actually. Right, that's very genius. So he would find a need, and he 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 would find niches like that. So so like what I would say is, you need to find like 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 you asked me how to make money on Amazon. It's almost like asking how to make money by opening up a store in King George. Amazon is just a mark, <laughs> you know. Amazon is just a place where you can sell. You still need a business idea, but one specific thing, what I would say, you got you got to find niches. You got to find something which not everybody does. Like like I I don't see maybe there are people who make money on phone cases. Is, you know, if you do some kind of unique phone case, but that's, you know, if you're trying to import phone cases and you're going to be a penny cheaper, you really, really it's really, really rough. 
Right. However, if you can come up with some kind of twist, and it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, create, you don't have to create a drone. If you can come up, and it doesn't have to be some, people think they have to create like drone, has to be drones or MP3 play, something which everybody needs. It doesn't have to. If you can come up with some, some kind of twist, you know, parts for the air conditioners or things like that. And, and, and find your niche market, Amazon is so big that you could do extremely well by that. And th- that, that's one thing what I would say. And I would say something else. You were talking about curlo, let's say curl wives or something. If you have some kind of, let's say, I don't know, you can create some kind of bib or, you know, which ties a certain way, which, which is cutesy and create nice colors and a nice brand. That's also something which can do extremely well. It doesn't have to be something which flies around or something great. It could be a little cute thing and, and, and you brand it right and you list it right. And one or two items you could be doing extremely well. Interesting. But yeah, of course, you, you still, and we'll get to that when we talk about the uh, Amazon group you formed. You still have to make sure that you're keeping to uh, Amazon's terms and uh, make sure you don't uh, get yourself kicked off. Right. P- see, p- part of the thing is that they don't, like when you start selling on Amazon, they, they don't want somebody just showing up and all of a sudden, you know, selling millions of dollars worth of product. They want, to, they want you to grow in slowly. They want to make sure you can handle it. As a matter of fact, I read in an article somewhere that if they sense you're growing too much, you know, they'll keep an, a, a double eye at you. you because you have to know how to grow. You have to hire employees. You have to get out of your basement. So, so interesting. Yeah. So they don't let you learn the system as you go. You got to be an expert <laughs> right away because they care so much about the Amazon brand. They didn't care that you're on Kyloni supporting a family and they, they couldn't <laughs> care less about that. Right. Uh, th- this has really been some, some great information so far and uh, it's fantastic. I know our listeners are really going to enjoy it. And But let, let's talk about now about this group that you formed, like how they got started. And, you know, that really excites me when you have, you know, how many people do you have in the group? Well, it's now close to 500. Wow, and and the majority are fr- are from Yiddin. Yeah, as far, as far as I know, it's a hundred percent from. Um, you know, I don't do any tests really, <laughs> but it's <laughs> but it's uh, you know it's say Shema. <laughs> what what <passion> is this week? <laughs> <laughs> right. So so what, basically what happened, I've been you know humming along like I said on Amazon ever since I got back ten years ago and I was selling on Amazon and I wasn't like you know I knew about the Amazon how how they suspend you for so easily. But it, it, I never had any issues, really never had every single customer taken care of. I never had any issue at all. And then one day, I think it was in March, I get this email that my selling privileges have been revoked, like out of, out of nowhere. So one day you're making money, you're making business, next day you're out of business. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I happen to be, um, I would say, once only 30, 40% Amazon. So for me, it's not, uh, it's still horrific. It's still terrible. You need the cash flow. And I also needed the, the drop shipping. They made it harder for me to drop ship. So if I bought something from eBay, like I had to manually, they didn't let that drop shipping system. Something, oh, wow. Yeah, something with the software got disconnected. They, they, they really make it, they much you to no end. I didn't know what to do. So, so they say that if you want to get back on Amazon, then I, you have to submit a plan of action, like how are you going to improve? And, and why did they kick me off? They said that I'm selling used as new. And of course, it's completely untrue. So how do you admit something where you did nothing wrong? Right. But I but I started googling and right away I saw that this is you know this is serious. So so I just sat down and I you know I gave them a whole thing that I'm going to double check the item, I'm going to triple check the item, al khayt al khayt, you know a whole thing. <laughs> and you know so I went back and forth and a couple of days later and and you know they would respond like you know you would send an email three days later they respond with a generic email you know we need more information. And, and 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 why did they think this about you? Why did they think though you were selling uh, something used when it was new? Right, well, that's a very that, that's a very question. So I'd find out because I, I've been so involved in this Amazon compliance. Amazon has something called an Amazon. Uh, it's called the repackaging service, which means that let's say somebody buys something from my Amazon account and they buy it and they open the packaging, they don't use it. And they send it back to Amazon. So of course Amazon refunds it, and they, and they send it back to me. So if you want to sign up to this repackaging service, they'll repackage it, and they'll send it back to the customer. And it makes sense. What's the point of it coming back to me in Brooklyn? They'll take care of the repackaging, and they'll send it directly to the customer. Okay. But what happens is the guy who repackages it is 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 a regular low level employee. So he just looks at it, he analyzes it, and if he thinks it's new, they'll repackage it. They probably take a look at it for half a second. And if they think it's new, they'll send it back. But in actuality, the guy may have registered the product even though it's still in the packaging. Or the guy may maybe he did use it. There's a guy in Amazon though. Yeah. Yeah, but but one hand doesn't talk to the next. So to sell a performance <sighs> people right. So 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 Wow, that's crazy. That's crazy. So all these little pieces of information, if you don't know 
is the difference between you staying in business or not. So all you have to do is go to your settings, go to manage F- your FBA inventory, and you have to deselect that option. But if you don't know that information, they could mutter you to no end. So this is why you need a group where, where everything is, if, if you're dealing with hundreds of people that are communicating together, it's called group sourcing. Every single issue, 100% of the issues get resolved because everyone has dealt with it at some point or another. So, you know, oh, two years ago I had, so that's why, like, so, so, so if this, would ha- if this happened to me, the first thing I did when we started this group, it started off with five, six people. When did you start, by the way? Well, it started right, right after I got, I got back on Amazon, you know, and I made some mistakes getting back on Amazon. Right after I got back on Amazon is when I realized that the reason why these things are happening is because there's no communication. And if we would communicate with each other, then we'll all be able to bounce things off to each other. So I just went to my brothers and brothers and brothers and said, let's make a WhatsApp chat and we'll just create and and anytime there's an issue we'll we'll just bounce it off you know if amazon is suspending for a certain thing then you know we tell everybody and we'll all be able to deal with it and i I just want to jump ahead and i just want to make one point because there was a little bit of a misconception when the group started that you know we're going to we're doing this thing to try to you know somehow game the system and beat the system nothing could be further than the truth we want to be compliant Sure. We, we million percent. You're not going to beat Amazon even if you want it, but we didn't want to beat. But but if, but we need every piece of information in order to accurately communicate with them. And, and the example I, I I like to give is let's say you're getting into your house and there's a combination number. So you can't kind of get it right, right? You got to get it exactly yeah. right. So with Amazon, that's how it is. When they want a certain piece of information, if you say, you know, I'm going to do better, and instead, and, and he should have said, I did do better, those little words are going to make a difference between you getting back on Amazon or they suspending you or not. So you need exactly real-time, accurate information. And I believe the only way you can do it is if hundreds of people work together. And besides, there are a lot of other things which were gained by many people working together. You know, we, we have a network now which, you know, software companies are all offering us all kinds of deals. And, you know, working together has been, it's been an amazing um, experience. And every, everyone realizes now how great it is. It used to be I would go to a show and, and people have told me this, that they would go to a show, they wouldn't even look at someone else selling on Amazon because they would be scared. They'd be selling each other's secrets and, and, and you know, why should he, you know, he's going to learn what I'm doing. Now, once we're all communicating together, we all see, you know, people from all over the world from different backgrounds that we're all dealing it's the same issue and we work incredibly incredibly well together so what else is, does is so your group just uh strictly shares amazon information or do you, or do joint ventures come together do people share other advice marketing advice social media advice right so so uh, it's very I, I happen to have written uh you know i've written a, a few um like political articles and stuff, which is maybe we could talk about at different times. But I, I also wrote an article about WhatsApp chatting. And I think many people need to know that if you look at most of your listeners, if they would look right now at their WhatsApp groups, they would see that 99% of it is complete waste and, you know, maybe even Lush and Hara, and it really doesn't add too much value. And I, was, right. I, I wrote this article and I, and I was saying that if WhatsApp, is a phenomenal tool if it's used right. But but the way the only way it could be used right is you have to follow very, very strict rules. You know, and, and this article that I wrote was the basis for this group, which I think is so successful. And like like for example, the zero talking about people, the zero joking, the zero soliciting even business. And it, everything is focused on what it is. Now we have different groups which talk about other things, but each group, the only way it could be successful is if it's laser focused on exactly what the group was created for. Sounds like a great article. We're going to link to it in, um, in our uh, show notes. So okay, great. We'll share, we'll share that with everybody. Okay, great. So the, the group exists only on WhatsApp? No, 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 no. So what, WhatsApp is, is not so... Um, when, first of all, WhatsApp has a limit of 100 people. And WhatsApp is... It's very hard. If, if you're familiar with WhatsApp, once you have more than 20 people, it's very hard to know who's talking to who. So there's an app called Telegram, which has a desktop, uh, which, which has a lot of... There were a lot of advantages for us switching to Telegram. First of all, it allowed for more than 100 people in a group. Also, you don't need a smartphone. So a lot of people don't have a smartphone. You can just put it on your desktop and you can create a username and you're just looking at the group and you're not, you know, you're not, you know, you didn't have any of the negatives, which you would have, you know, which I understand where people don't want to be on, you know, social media networks. You just, you have a desktop at work on your group. It's strictly, strictly professional. And it's, and I know quite a few people have, have liked it that, they don't have to have it on the phone. They don't have to have a smartphone. They just have it on the desktop. And, and there are a lot of advantages, which is probably beyond the scope of this phone call. But, the, but Telegram is a fantastic app for something like this. We have all kinds of different side rooms which talk about a lot of different specific things of selling online. Mm-hmm. So that's so okay. So that's so you communicate mostly through Telegraph. And 
but again, it, do you are so you have other groups within the groups where you're able to where people that want to discuss more business aspects or marketing ideas or imp, or manufacturing in China or you know sharing that type of information. Yeah, we, we have we have like a you know uh, you know like a general chat, business chat, where things like that. We, there are certain things which I specifically did not want. Like I didn't want to do like you know people buying deals together, and I, I just thought it would be too disruptive and. You know, it would lead to discord, you know, like someone would sell something who got suspended in the Amazon. I, I just I just thought it was more negative than positive. So I try to keep it strictly focused. You know, we have for, for Amazon selling in different types. You know, we could talk about private label within Amazon or we could talk about selling on other channels. But it, but it's pretty, pretty laser focused on what we want to accomplish. We, we, we also have like a u- human resources room. If somebody in Amazon wants to, and I know countless people who found jobs that way where Somebody selling on Amazon because they're dealing with hundreds of businesses, so they always need somebody. So they would post, uh, you know, I need for a few weeks, I need someone, you know, taking pictures and doing a bunch of listings, and, you know, people would respond. So recently you did do uh, something offline. You had a gathering at, uh, or is it Abigail's in New York? Yeah, what we did was at that point, the group was probably half the size of what it is now. Because this was more or less a grassroots type of thing, and uh, talking about staying on Amazon and what to do that you shouldn't be kicked off. So some people started mentioning that maybe we should get together and have some kind of uh, get together because people were getting incredible amounts of help. Sure. And and literally hundreds of businesses are being helped every day at the same time. And they, you know you wanted to know who it was. You wanted to see them. Or, so we created like a mini event. And at the event, we, which was in Abigail's, at the event, we, we hired a few ex-Amazon employees who we knew who were, who were experts in this field and they spoke. It was done extremely professional. We had three professional speakers. We had this guy Chris McCabe and this Ellie Cat who was one of the first online sellers selling on AOL, a very successful online seller and, and it was, we also had a, a Q&A session. It was extremely successful and we had like a crazy amount of publicity. Everybody was talking about it. It was really, it was really a beautiful event. And the best part was, you know, it was people, Hasidim, and literally everyone from different backgrounds. And, you know, it worked. It was fine. Beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. So what's next for the group? Where do you see this going? Well, I, I, think, I think this is going to continue like it is. And, you know, I, I, I think there are opportunities where we can get deals by, with software companies and, you know, maybe shipping vendors by, by networking and grouping our, our resources together. So I think it's pretty much gonna, going to continue and I, I just think it's going to keep growing because there's definitely a need for it. And people are learning really how to work together without in any way whatsoever jeopardizing their own business. And I actually also think, and, I've, and I, there's, a, there's a couple of ideas which I've already started. I think this concept of using like a group, a group source concept, but if it's tightly moderated that nothing off topic is, is, is discussed, is an amazing tool and it can be used, I think, for quite a lot of other things, other businesses. And I already started another initiative, which I'd rather not say now, in which people can work together. And it's, I, I think group chatting is one of the best inventions in the last 50 years. Wow. And I just think that, that, that it's a shame that people don't know how to use it properly. And uh, can you imagine, like, you have all the doctors in the world, the top, you know, 300 doctors in a room sitting in, a, in, a, in an organized Telegram or WhatsApp group um, working on leukemia. It'll probably, be, it'll, it'll probably be cured in six months. But what's, ha- hmm. what, what's happening is you have, you have, you know, one amazing genius in Denmark and one amazing genius in Switzerland and in Israel. But if they, they would be in constant communication and they would group source their concepts, it wouldn't be, if you have 300 people, it's not 300 times better, it's 1,000 times better, it's 10,000 times better. Right. So I, I think this concept, and if anyone's listening and they want to reach out to me, I can, uh, you know, it's just a few steps you have to follow. I can, I can help you moderate it. And it's just uh, an incredible opportunity, e- even, even I, I think even for learning, you know, if you have a bunch of people, you do it in a professional way. But what happens is, is once you get to 10, 20 people, you know, one person gets in and he, and he thinks it's funny and he makes his jokes and you're giving, <laughs> and you're giving, and you're giving like, you know, any person a platform to talk in front of a hundred people and some people, they get all excited and all giddy and they ruin it for everybody else and, and no one has the guts right. to get up and, and stand and, and explain so people just leave the group and the whole thing falls apart but if you're strict then you know like when I started this thing like I absolutely insisted on zero Lush and how I didn't 
care of how 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 much the guy stole from you and you know right. unless not, horror comes you get kicked out of the group yeah even even if even if you even if you have a, a rabbi he used to tell me he said that some some mitzvahs uh, he doesn't want to do and some are various he wants to do and people say you know it's a mitzvah to talk bad about this guy he doesn't want to do those mitzvahs <laughs> and the guy says you know it's a, it's a way to help him those mitzvahs he wants to do <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I mean, really, really great stuff here. You know, this has so far been, you know, absolutely fantastic. I, I want to do what we call our lightning round, where I'll ask you, you know, a bunch of a uh, few random questions just to learn a little bit more about you and, you know, get more advice for uh, our listeners. So speaking of advice, what would you say is the best advice you ever received in business? The best advice in business, I would say, uh, well, my father always says not to pay too much attention, you know, to what other people say and and care and he also always, always he always says that you're competing against yourself and not not worry so much you know how good the other guy is going to do just do the best which you can do and it's normally going to be good enough excellent excellent great advice uh what book would you recommend to our listeners and why Okay, I'm a I'm a big fan of Barrel Wine, and even though it doesn't didn't write any business books as far as I know, but Triumph <laughs> Triumph of Survival, which talks which is he he has history books in which he breaks down different eras, and Triumph of Survival is the modern era, like from I think 1700 until until 19, you know, whenever the book was written, and right. and I don't think people understand so much today, like like today our biggest issue is selling on Amazon, they're going to kick you off, they're not going to kick you off. But the fact that your firm is almost zero of a neg- negative, and I don't think people appreciate how much that is, because even even 40 years ago, that wasn't the case. And if you read a book like that, you'll understand it a little better. Excellent. Excellent. What is one of your favorite online tools? Well, I guess you gave us one Telegram, you said already, is, uh, was one you used. Uh, but what's another one that you use? And what do you love about it? I like Tplex, which is a great inventory and shipping software. There's also what's it called? Tplex, T E A P P L I X. Okay. And there's also we didn't get into it maybe some other time, but it's called Thompson, which which allows you. Oh, manufacturing directory. No, 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 Thompson. Which which what, what it does is it. You allow it, it offers you, and it's within Amazon guidelines. You allow to give Amazon, you allow to give customers a certain discount, and they give you a, a non-biased review, which is ninety-five percent of the time is good. Amazon is cracking down a little bit of that, so <laughs> so. But but they always what's what's good about it is if you're dealing with a company like that, they always make sure it's in terms of services. Great. And right, what would you what, tell me something that you've purchased for less than a hundred dollars that's had the greatest impact on your life? Okay, that's very easy. It's actually less than ten dollars because uh, I'm on my phone a little too much, and my wife didn't like it. So I bought myself uh, an alarm clock, which is very hard to find on Amazon for like six dollars. One of those old-fashioned alarm clocks. This way, right. I can keep my phone when when I go to sleep. At least I can keep it downstairs, and I I don't have to say that I need it for my alarm clock. <laughs> that's great. Maybe uh, if they're hard to find on Amazon, maybe it's the next product. Right. Th- those are the type of things which you'd be surprised, you know, like these old, you know, some kind of twist, some kind of niche. Right. Great. Great. Tell me something that you believe in that other people think is insane. Something which I believe in, which other people think. It, I would say what I mentioned before, that group chatting and group sourcing is one of the great innovations of the last 50 years and that it could literally cure diseases. That's how, that's how uh, you, you know, I, yeah, I could see that you're saying that it could really cure diseases and people will be like, yeah, OK. Yeah. No, pe- no, people think I'm crazy because most people, when they think WhatsApp, it's just a place of, you know, to send cute videos and Donald Trump speeches. But, <laughs> but uh, I think the, the way I see group chatting, I think it's an incredible thing. The, the world has never seen this concept where, where 500 people would have a, a specific issue can work together. And when you have 500 people working together in a professional, every issue will get solved. Beautiful, beautiful. And uh, I guess we'll go with one last question. When you hear the word successful, who do you think of first and why? When I hear the word successful, who do I think of? Okay, I have, um, well, I'm very close with all my siblings. So I would say I, one, 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 you know, I would say one particular, my younger brother, Lipa, he's, he's an incredible person. He, he, he actually has, a, he runs a search and rescue team. And every time, like in the tri-state area, someone's lost, he's always the first person who they contact. He's like the, the, the logistics guy. He has a whole ATV crew. And when I, hear, uh-huh. when I hear successful, I always say someone who's successful in his field, but someone what 
that doesn't care, well, not only does he care about the whole world, he also cares about his own siblings and wife and kids. And I, and I can tell you with my brother, he cares more, you know, just more about his siblings and his wife and his kids, I would say probably. And, and he also helps the whole world. So I would say someone who was successful at what he does, but he lives it for himself too. Like if somebody is a marriage counselor and he's divorced, so I'm not going to be so, even though he, he's put together many <laughs> marriages, I'm not going to be so impressed. Right. Beautiful. That just reminds me of uh, uh, my wife is from Panama, and um, she always, she always likes to tell me that the person that was in he- the head of the you know of the nutritional department, I guess, of the government of Panama, like was super morbid obese and right. weighed hundreds of pounds. And right, I, I, I remember that. Funny, like that's the person that's uh, in charge of health. Right, I, I remember I had a dentist also, so his, his like teeth were you know were horrible. <laughs> so I, I would say success I would say someone was successful at what he does but also you see it that he lives it and not just that he teaches it beautiful well Ephraim this has been absolutely fantastic I thank you so much I mean, I've learned a lot I know our listeners are going to really enjoy this episode uh, we'll link to you uh, ways to get in touch with you for people that want to learn more or do you do consulting at all like Amazon consulting um, do I do consulting well there are people in our group who know a lot more than I do I, I, so you know I could definitely direct you to Amazon consultants I myself I do not know okay you just concentrate on your business I concentrate on my business and this group probably takes half my time right now so yeah I, I, I would say right now no I'm not available for consulting no I, <laughs> although I, I, what I do do is I try to direct I was trying to get you some business of <laughs> no, if I, anybody needs any motorcycle uh, you know accessories right. no, I, I try to direct uh, people to you know people who do it you know experts but but I myself no I do not okay Brian again thank you so much for the time thank you for joining us I can't wait to you know I'm definitely going to keep in touch with you and uh, this has been absolutely fantastic so thank you again okay my pleasure thank you so much for having me, and I hope to see you in Israel sometime very soon oh my name is Shannon dinner's on me <laughs> okay thank you thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nahum Kligman we hope you learned something valuable and will share this with your friends for show notes archives of previous episodes and more information to help you start and grow your business please visit our website www.fromentrepreneur.com listen learn be Masliak.